welcome everybody. Um, this is going to be our last Day in the Woods program for 2021. And today we're focusing on woodland boundaries. Um, we're going to do something a little different today. I'm Dave Apsley. I'm with the OSU Extension. And uh, I'm glad to introduce Mark Rickey. Uh, Mark is a state service forester with Ohio Division of Forestry with ODNR. And today we're going to do things a little differently. I'll run through uh, what we're planning for today, but we're real excited because we've been working hard for the past several months to create a video series, and we've got several videos ready to launch and share today. Um, so again, this is a Day in the Woods program, and I'm going to step out of the way so you can see my background, but Day in the Woods is a partnership with lots of partners. Principal partners are us at OSU Extension, Division of Forestry, U.S. Forest Service, and you can see all the other partners who play a major role. We really like to do Day in the Woods programs live, in person, and in the field with a nice lunch, like we mentioned. But today, we're going to do this uh, virtually because we're in the winter months. Um, if one thing positive has come out of COVID, um, we've learned to do things virtually, and we'll be able to offer some programming through the winter months sometimes, which we haven't been able to do in the past. So what we've got planned for today is, um, well, first of all, let's start out with a poll. We'll see how this works out. I'm gonna launch a little poll. We're gonna do a pre and a post test with this poll. So we're not gonna discuss it much and uh, just see what you folks think. Um, Mark, are you seeing the poll popped up and Danny? I am. Are you able to participate? Uh, to, yep, and uh, just to let everybody know, there's no pass and fail. We're good. Yeah, yes, we can I see even, it. <clears throat> we can't even see who you are, how you answer. So don't feel embarrassed to answer, but, but we'll give folks a little bit of time to participate in the poll. And again, there are four questions. So it looks like it's about even. 37% uh, said that their boundaries are properly marked. 35% think maybe and 28 say no. Who owns the trees on the boundary? Most people think it's both. How should you treat lime trees during a timber harvest? Do not harvest, harvest only with permission of the adjacent landowner. Well, that's good. When should you consider hiring a surveyor? And it looks like most people selected most of those answers. And I did not share the results. So I, I uh, was going through that without you seeing them, but that's kind of the pretest. I'll have that saved and then we'll revisit that later. But um, from the results I'm seeing, folks are pretty educated already on woodland boundaries. So Mark, I think it's time to start the PowerPoint up. So we're Excellent. turning it over to Mark Rickey and he's gonna just do a quick overview on woodland boundaries. There's a lot more information we're gonna share through video later, but this is kind of just an overview and a starting point. Take it away, Mark. All righty. All right, welcome. Uh not really to the woods today, but close as we're gonna get. Um, thanks for joining us today and we'll see if we can't uh, hopefully get at least some nugget of information out to everybody. Cause I do realize we have a variety of people in our audience today of different experience levels and dealing with boundaries. So off we go. Uh, this is locating the marking process for your boundaries. And again, we have a whole video series. Uh, so we're only gonna hit some highlights here through this but uh, it'll be expanded upon through the video series that'll be readily available. All right, basically, why paint your property boundaries? And that's a big question I get out of landowners that uh, the boundaries, uh, again, this is the first step to being a successful landowner and getting the most enjoyment out of your property and getting the most use out of the property. And when I say out of your property and as a landowner, I want some of the folks on the call today to realize or on the webinar and so forth down the road to realize that if you're a property manager, it's basically you're the landowner in this case. So we're trying to convey the right messages and keep our users in the right places and so forth. So, all right. So again, as a landowner or a land manager, most of your issues start at the boundary line, don't they? That's pretty much the beginning of the troubles or Again, in this case, what we're gonna to try to do is pretty much the beginning of how to keep the troubles from happening. So 
again, what we already hit on here a little bit that we included in the poll is know what is yours, know what is theirs. And then the best part for me is know what is ours. And you ask, what is ours? Yeah, fair question. Most people do not know. So we'll get that here in a minute. So again, going back to why mark your boundaries. Well, boundaries add value to your property. Uh, it helps certainly down the road if people are looking at property to buy or sell to know exactly what's offered. Okay. So um, making sure others know where your lines are. This is a big one I hear in dealing with landowners in my everyday job. They really don't like the idea of painting boundaries the first time. But again, I will say that I've never had a landowner say they didn't wish they had done that yet. Uh, everybody's 100% across the board saying, that, wow, I got boundaries marked and it's much better now. Uh, but again, the big thing is, like I point out there, that's great, you know where your boundaries are, but does everybody else? And again, you won't be there all the time. So just remember that the boundaries are for everyone's benefit. So again, helping out landowners and land managers, who else knows this important information where the boundaries are? If you're the only one that knows, well, that's a high risk of losing that information. So again, family speaking wise and so forth, as a private landowner, does your spouse, children, family, friends, hunters, neighbors, biologists, you name it, the list goes on and on. Uh, can they easily identify it? And that'll save a lot of people some good headaches down the road. Again, just think as a landowner or land manager, if you're paying somebody to go out and do things like cutting grapevines in a project, you don't want them cutting the neighbors. You don't want to pay them to do that and so forth. Um, so again, well-marked boundaries avoid many honest mistakes. Um, boundary paint is not going to keep unethical people from doing what they do but it is going to help you down the road uh, if that does uh, occur. And we will certainly touch on that more. So right here in this nice example, you can see this big white oak tree. It has a smile cut as we refer to it, cut out of it from where a timber harvesting operation decided they were going to cut the tree down. Uh, at the bottom of it, you can see a little bit of blue ribbon and certainly you can see the blue paint on the tree. Uh, this is a lime tree and What's interesting about trees in general for me as a forester, but also as surveyors, we worked with a professional land surveyor on putting together more information later on this too. Uh, and from lawyers and so forth is, again, this thing gets a little tricky on how to deal with this because there's value associated with this boundary marker. So that's a little different than a rock, okay? So again, uh, we asked the poll question about how do you deal with lime trees in a timber harvest and who owns them and stuff like that. So again, let's boil it down a little farther. Who gets to select the trees to be removed during a timber harvest? In my experience of seeing this, it's usually the operator, the logger, the timber buyer, that type of thing, not even the two landowners or one landowner. So again, how do we determine what are to be cut? Hmm leave some gray area for sure. Who receives the proceeds from the lime trees? So we're kind of hinting to some things coming, aren't we? Here we go. Here is a nice article that I use on a regular basis about property laws for neighbors. And I love to start out with Robert Frost's famous poem quote there. So good laws make for good neighbors. Well, good boundaries make for good neighbors too. I've highlighted for you the parts dealing with trees. And in the farming world, they tend to focus on overhanging trees, certainly a big issue. Um, but the last paragraph that's highlighted there in yellow for you is the biggie that talks about it being or how to treat line trees. Uh, the other thing that's nice in there is the trespassing right up right there. And this will all be available for you later. Uh, these are some of our resources that we supply to you. Um, again, discussing what trespass is and how Ohio law addresses that. And just again, like it says right there in that paragraph, in Ohio law, you do not have to have signage up to enforce trespass. So it boils down to the intent. And we'll get more on that later. And we'll have Peggy Kirkhall jo joining us from OSU uh, later here at 11 o'clock. And uh, she'll help guide us through some legal questions. So, all right. So now we're boiling it down to who can locate boundaries? Well. Again, anybody can if they know what they're looking for and if they can find the proof of it. 
you do not have to be a licensed surveyor to go out and find your survey pin. But what happens if you have no evidence? Now we're down to, it's time for the licensed surveyor. Get you a professional land surveyor organization member and have to pay the services and get it done right. So remember, they are the only ones who can legally set and remove survey markers. So again, if something is directly called for in your deed, like stones, pins, trees, posts, again, you have to have a plan to replace that. You can't just arbitrarily jerk it out of the ground and say, okay, now I'm sticking something else here and now it's the boundary. That does not work from a legal standpoint. It's not a deed record at the courthouse. All right, so now we get down into it here about the locating the property and marking the property. And step one is you got to get a good map. So courthouse is a fantastic place to start out at the engineer's office. Uh, we have varying degrees of quality of maps at courthouses. But again, that is the official maps that you start with. I really suggest getting one that has aerial photographs uh, with the boundary lines over top of it, if, if it's available. And if you can get it with the topographic lines on there, it's even better to help narrow down out on the ground of what point you're looking for and where it's at. And if it's really nice, uh, they will even have symbols at the corners and things to tell you what you're looking for. So very helpful. Um, second part, man, this one's a good one. Most of my landowners I talk to don't know where their deed is and they haven't really looked at it. Get a copy of your deed. It is critical because it tells you not only what you're looking for, but where it should be and how to get there the directions, the distance, et cetera, that goes involved with finding that thing. So again, you're gonna see some of these videos here in a little bit, and you're gonna see me locating some boundary evidence and uh, don't think I'm the uh, blind squirrel that's finding the little pin out there by accident. I gotta know what I'm looking for first. So next we are into locate all boundary evidence that you can find. Ribbon it first as a temporary method, Make sure to talk to your neighbors and so forth. And again, pink is a normal boundary marking ribbon color that I see out and about. And you don't have to use any certain color, but ribbon at first. Talk to your neighbors a little bit on that to make sure before you start getting into permanent marking. Uh, again, what you're looking for is the survey pins, uh, also known as stakes, pipes, et cetera, described in the deeds. Uh, again, I've seen everything from car axles to you name it, stuck in the ground. And again, those are fine if they're called for in the deed. So um, the old fence lines, uh, posts that have been driven in the ground are great. Uh, where the fence has grown into the trees are great. Again, when a fence line is laying on the ground, it's not a guarantee that that's where your boundary is. It's just in the area. So then you'll see more of that in the video as well. Um, anything that is called for in your deed, is again, what you're looking for. So if it tells you just like this example, go 508 feet at 90 degrees east to the white oak tree. Well, I hope you know your white oak trees because that's what you're shooting for. Uh, again, the tree may be long gone. Somebody may have removed it and so forth. So that gets you into that whole thing down the road that you'll see in videos of how to deal with that situation. So the next statement here is you should work your boundary evidence and build your evidence at all times, like it's a court case. Basically, it may be someday, okay? So that's how I work boundaries. I'm always thinking of building my proof, building my case. So step two, again, speaking to your adjoining neighbors, and I hope you guys can see this picture, this little pink ribbon around there is a kind of a temporary marker, but if you look past the tree to the left, you'll see the neighbor's shooting hut for hunting right on the boundary. So when you do put the ribbon up, just like a note here, odds are you're gonna to get to communicate with your neighbors, at least the ones that have an interest in your property, because it'll become real obvious real quick as to who is around and who's using it for what or who's close to it or whatever. And that's okay. Next, uh, we wanna to go to step three here, which is locate a good quality boundary paint. They sell boundary paint. A lot of places make actual boundary paint. Now, I certainly encourage you to do that. A good oil-based paint. Uh, we prefer you pr apply it with a brush and a gallon can, as you'll see in the videos. Um, not an absolute must. Uh, if you want to use aerosols, you can certainly do that, but you'll be doing it more frequently. 
Um, again, uh, we're going to introduce you to the universal system of marking and a boundary uh, for woodlands and basically be consistent. So again, here we have the three dots for a corner, two dots for a lime tree, and one dot facing the boundary on the nearest tree that you can get or post or something that's close by. Uh, if at all possible, try to stay on that boundary line as much as you can. Um, when you don't have anything there, you can even add things to it as we will discuss later. But uh, if you can't get right on the line, get as close to you, the line as you can with a face mark on the tree facing the line. Uh, be sure when you're using facing marks that you alternate so people can see it coming from both directions. Because again, a boundary is not as useful if you only go one direction. And I know you guys probably can't see this right now on the diagram to the right, but don't worry that again is a part of our package here today of the products that we have available for you to reference later and be able to pull up and look at closer. Uh, so this is a, again, a write-up that we use here on how to mark boundaries with this system. Uh, I like a visual effect as well as talking about it because again, we all learn things differently as human beings. Some learn from reading, some learn from viewing, and some learn from doing. And so again, here's the write-up I hand out to all my landowners. And uh, that is on here as well. It's available resource for you later. And so again, it's really a lot of talk to this point. So the big thing is, what does it look like? So this is what it looks like as far as a finished product. So we're getting ready to do that. So, ah, I think Dave might've slipped one in on me here. Signage is good, but you gotta convey the right message. Don't blame me for I'm that. Sure. I'm not sure that that's quite the right message we were shooting for, but anyway, I did take that picture. It is an actual picture, so it is not arranged. Um, working on boundaries all this time, I've seen a lot of interesting ones. So. Again, if you are gonna put signage up, remember there's a certain amount of literacy that has to go into it on both ends. So here's a close-up version of that little slide so you can see it a little better. And again, it just uh, is outlining to everybody what it looks like visually to go along with the words, okay? Here's what it looks like when you're getting ready to paint and when it has been painted. And what I wanted to show here is the temporary ribboning of a corner on the left. You can see the three ribbons around a nice big post. And then that last ribbon is tied down. And I know you guys can't see this at this scale, but it's tied all the way down to the actual survey pin. And again, that's what you wanna highlight. You wanna show that you know where you're at and your evidence is there. And again, if somebody comes along and says, well, I got better evidence, than what you've got. That's even better because you're still all trying to find the same thing. Uh, on the right, you can see the picture of the red paint. Those are lime trees painted through an area that's recently been harvested. Uh, again, as you're doing boundaries, remember you're not always in control of what happens on the other side of the boundary, so the conditions can change rapidly. Uh, this is a great example of showing the regrowth in there, and it disappears quick, and especially when the foliage is on in summertime. So we're not going to lecture too much on all that because this is all in our videos of when to do it, how to do it, where to do it, so forth. So we're going to keep moving here. Uh, hey, Mark, before you do that, I have a question that popped up sure. that is pretty relevant with what you're talking about right now. And, and it's from Sean, and he asked, dots or stripes? I use two-inch wide stripes, triple for corners. Never heard of dots. Um, maybe a regional thing for dots, but uh, in, re in reality, we're using rectangles, dots, anything. Um, in reality, I will just tell you that any paint is better than no paint. If you want to use uh, stripes because you're a Bengals fan, that's fine. Uh, if you want to use dots, uh, I've seen crosses. Uh, I've seen all kinds of things. But again, the main point is be consistent. Um, kind of like uh, what I'm getting ready to do right now for you. Um, again, the message here today isn't so much what color paint, because again, in Ohio law, it doesn't really matter. And I know I'm the first guy to change a shirt right in front of everybody, probably on any kind of educational video. But again, I want you to remember the point. It's not about the collar, it's about the message. Any shirt's better than no shirt for me right now, right? So any paint's better than no paint, okay? So let's go to the maintenance part. Cause again, getting the boundaries painted the first time is the headache, but again, it doesn't just magically happen and it never shows up ever again. You need to do this about every three to five years. 
And the real kick in this, or the real trick in this is how much sunlight is available to the paint. That's what dictates how fast it'll fade. So the more sunlight becomes available to a timber harvest, or if your boundary happens to run along the edge of a neighbor's hay field, uh, it's going to get more sunlight and you're going to want to stay on top of it a little sooner. Okay. So again, those are the main things on refreshing this and going back and as you do your boundaries, it shows everybody you're active on your property. Uh, you will see the changes that are happening. So, and, I, and again, remember, you're trying to communicate your boundary, not only to your users, but to your neighbor's users of the property, okay? So, and also when you use this universal marking system like this, your neighbors will come and say, well, you put paint, one dot of paint over here and that's my tree. Again, if we're using a face mark, it's indicating where the line is away from that tree. So it, it's fairly common for people to get a little worked up when they first see a boundary painting if they haven't ever seen it before. So again, share your knowledge and communicate it with your neighbors, with your visitors, everything, and with your friends and family, if they own land and all to spread the word, that's the main thing. Good boundaries are certainly helpful. Um, they make my job a whole heck of a lot easier. And as an administrator for Ohio Forest Tax Law out on the ground, I have to check boundaries for everybody to get in that program. So I get to see a lot of boundaries. And again, good boundaries are a heck of a good start. So that wraps up our presentation for today. Here's Dave and I's contact information. I hope you guys enjoy the picture. I do have to give a little, a little credit to my former uh, service forester, Tim Wilson, who uh, snapped this picture one day over in Benton County for us. And I thought it was very fitting for a ending here. And then Dave, it's all you from here. Thanks, Mark. Before you forget, would you kind of lean sideways and show them your background? Oh, or, that's Am right. I giving something away too early? Yeah, no, you're perfectly fine. Uh, we have good examples and bad examples of boundary paint. And yes, uh, it's not my blue hair helmet here today. It's, uh, remember, scale is important. That is my finger on the post of the landowner's painting. You're trying to highlight your boundaries, not hide them. So you can see that boundary paint is not going to be something you can see unless you're standing right on top of it. So that really doesn't cut it. Okay. Okay. I am going to share a screen. We're not done. We're just done with the formal presentation part of this. And I'm going to share a screen and hopefully can share some resources with folks. Um, are you now seeing the Google screen there, Mark? Is that showing up? Yep. Yep. Okay. It shows up. So I want folks, and Danny, if you can put this in the uh, chat box, that'd be great too. But we're going to a website, Southeast Ohio Woods, and we're going to do a little tour and show you some resources that are out there. The website is u.osu.edu slash seohiowoods. And Danny's got it there in the in the box. This is important that you know how to go there because we're going to take a little break here in a little bit and allow you to watch a couple of videos. But I want to do a quick tour of this site. Um, it's where we do all of our Day in the Woods advertising, marketing, and all the information about Day in the Woods occurs on this site. But what I want to really draw your attention to is this black banner across the top. And realize we've got lots of resources there for you. For instance, if you click on this chainsaw safety, we have nine videos on chainsaw safety. Other recordings, there's about 40 recordings, mostly from past Day in the Woods programs, but some other short videos. Uh, tree ID, we're up to about 74 or 75 tree ID videos, all housed right here. And then finally, if you click on this new link called Woodland Boundaries, um, it should pop, it may take a second. You're gonna see some new resources that are available to you. So right now we have six videos that Mark and I have been working on. Gosh, Mark, when do we start? Back in April? Yes, sir. So we started in April when we started recording some videos. So here's what we've got so far and we're not done. We're working on a couple more. We've got ideas for a few more. So we'll launch more over time, but this is, I think I'm pretty amazed we got this much done with everything else that's going on. So we've got an intro video, which we're gonna have folks watch here in a little bit. 
We've got one on re real details on how to locate the boundaries, things like fence, things like corners and posts. Um, so lots of detailed evidence or descriptions of how to do that and some demonstrations on how to go about doing that. This is my favorite video because it highlights a bush light can on the, one of the corners. There's actually a stake there with a beer can on the top, but it highlights very nicely an actual corner pin that's mentioned in the survey. So there's another one. You also see some face marks. Mark's painted that tree up and prepped it. We get a little bit more into woodland boundaries and that evidence and how you should treat it, especially survey markers and how critical it is to to not only highlight those, but to maintain those. Dave, if I can interject there on that one yes, sir. picture real quick. Um, this one? Not sure, yep, yeah, right there. Uh, again, out of doing this starting in April and then finishing it up in October, in that time period, I want the whole group to understand that we ribboned that site. And then we came back and we hit that site a second time and all the ribbon was gone. So it's a prime example of ribbon isn't as good as paint because it can disappear in a hurry. Dave, it's all you. Yep. And then we've got one on painting supplies and recommendations on how to go about painting and how to prep for painting. And um, that's a good, just quick overview on that. And then finally, one on boundary trees. And this is probably my favorite video of all of them because we actually go out, we're on a boundary, we uh, show what it looks like before it's painted. We talk about the importance of blazing the boundaries and then Mark demonstrates how to paint. Um, so that I think is, is probably my favorite. It also talks about the importance of those line trees and how they should be treated and so forth. So those are the six videos that are currently available. And again, we're hoping to add at least two, if not three or more. We and also then, like the last video because we got a little creative there and we emphasize the time of year. And I'll just leave it at that. Yep. And then Mark mentioned several resources. So if you want to download his boundary marking instructions, it's highlighted. If you want to see that article he referenced about property laws, if you need an Ohio land surveyor, or if you want to learn more about fence line law, we've got hot links to either download a document or to take you to a website with more information. So this is uh, the resources we're talking about. And now we're doing something we've never done before. Um, hopefully uh, this works, but we tried to play these videos and share them around and we have some bandwidth issues and Mark and I are sitting on some pretty good internet connections. So we didn't want to assume that everybody had really good internet connections. So we're going to take about a 25 minute break and we'd like for you to go to Southeast Ohio Woods and I'm going to type it in again. Uh, Mark, go ahead while I'm typing. I would like to put out a disclaimer there before we get going too far, Dave, because we didn't highlight it too much in these videos. I just want to be very clear to everybody that in my normal everyday function as a state service forester for ODNR, I do not go out and locate boundaries for people. I check them, but I don't go locate them. Uh, some consulting foresters are available to do that and so forth. So we can always get you a list of those. But again, I just don't want to misrepresent that I'm going to come out and find your boundaries for you. We want those to be done before we get there so we can maximize our benefit while we're there too. Yep. So I put in the chat, what we want everybody to do is to go to Southeast Ohio Woods, click on the Woodland, Woodland Boundary link and view the first and the last video. So view videos number one and number six. And then we're gonna take about 25 minutes. So actually we might as well make it right dead on 11 o'clock. That gives everybody a nice break. The two videos combined are under 20 minutes. So take a little break, watch the videos, um, and then come back and join us at 11 o'clock. And by then we'll do a Q&A session. We'll answer the questions in the chat. We'll answer the questions in the Q&A. And then hopefully Peggy Kirk Hall will be on as well to help us um, with that Q&A session. So you're welcome to leave Stay on to the Zoom if you can watch them, watch them on another device or this device, or you can log off and log back on when you get a chance. So we'll see everybody back at about 11 o'clock. So I have 11 o'clock. 
And in order to start the Q&A thing off again, what I want to do is the post test. And then we'll use the results of the post test to start the Q&A. So I'm going to launch the poll and give folks a chance to uh, participate in the poll. This will do a couple things. It'll let us know that people are back out there listening. And so we'll see same questions. Just curious if the answers have changed. And then this will give us a chance to see who's out there and how many folks are actually actively participating. And I noticed Peggy joined us. Welcome, Peggy. Hi, thank you. I can't turn my video on, but I am here. Um, but if you Try guys it. want me to, uh, if you Try want to allow me. You're co-host now. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hi, Peggy. So, <laughs> hi, how'd the program go? Any legal questions I can answer? Where we're getting to that, we we uh, so we did the program and uh, we allowed about twenty minutes to watch a couple of the videos we produced, and now people are joining us back. So we're going to do a Q and A session, but we're doing this. We did this a pre test and a post test to kind of kick off the the Q and A part. So that's mm. what we've got going now. So we've had thirty nine people respond to that, and that's slowing down. Um, at one time we had 84 total people on, but when we released them for watching videos, I don't know how many will join us back. So we'll just have to see how that goes. But let's, uh, we're at 39 respondents. So I think that's enough to uh, get us going with the Q&A. Are you guys seeing me sharing the Q&A now or mm -hmm. post-test? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so Mark, you want to? work your way through these or you need to help you how what's the best way to so i'll actually let peg peggy do the second one put her on the spot mm -hmm. but the first one's just curious how people felt about their own boundaries and at least some of them think that they've got it done a pretty good job and that number didn't change a lot from the beginning so we've got a lot of educated landowners and folks out there about marking boundary which is good the next question we left it kind of blank or kind of vague but who owns the trees on the property boundary is the question. And looks like the answer is both. So that's a, what do you guys think, Peggy and Mark? Do you guys just want to discuss that a little bit? Peggy, you I, first. I saw your video, Mark, that um, where you were explaining that, that trees on the boundary are under what we call co-tenancy in Ohio law. So that means you both own and have rights to those trees uh, legally. And so that means any changes to those trees needs to be a joint decision. And that's a little tricky. Yeah. So and, yes, everyone answered correctly there. And it looks like the next question kind of goes into it a little bit deeper. If it's a boundary tree and there's a harvest going on, uh, how do you treat it? And it looks like they did a pretty good job on the answer to that as well. But Mark, do you want to discuss that a little further? Because we get into a lot of situations down here with boundary trees, and Mark posed a question to me, and I think we've got it right, but it'll be nice to get Peggy to confirm what, well, what our thoughts are on that. I'm not sure which question I posed to you, Dave. We have many over this, um, over this well, whole process. Um, but that basically, what we see a common tendency down here, Peggy, and you can help me out with this discussion, Dave. What we see, uh, what I run into a lot of times after a timber harvest is everybody says, oh, well, we took every other tree. And I mentioned this in the video, every other tree is not dealing with a shared property correctly. Mm -hmm. As again, now we get into who picks the tree and all that. And that's what question three is about. And then we get into, I even put that in the PowerPoint a little bit about who gets the proceeds of that. Because again, a lot of times loggers and landowners are doing a 50-50 deal, uh, splitting the profits 50-50. So in a roundabout way, does the neighbor get 25%? Yeah. Do they get 50%? Right, right. And, you know, and, and you could address that through an agreement, a legal right. agreement. But if yeah. you don't have that legal agreement, I, I agree with you completely, Mark. That's not a good solution. No, they're off limits unless both parties agree legally to deal with it. And, and the, the landowner, in a lot of cases, if the landowner who's selling the timber is not making a good decision and undersold them, you know, sold them at a lower value than we think they're worth, then that's not fair to the neighbor. So, you know, that landowner who is adjacent, who's not part of that harvest, uh, does not have to sell those trees unless they want to. And then agreed, they could help determine value and decide on a price 
which doesn't have to depend on the agreement with the logger that's already been made. So mm -hmm. all, um, all good well, questions. Real quick, Dave, further on that. Um, Peggy, if you got to see in that example, uh, the, and everybody did get to see the PowerPoint earlier of the smile cut out of the big white oak tree. The trick in dealing with this is some of these boundary markers actually have value as opposed to a rock that's a cut stone or something. It really doesn't have a value. So that's where things get really tricky in dealing with bigger trees of some sort of value as a boundary marker. Uh, what further, I guess I'm cursed and blessed to be straddling the difference in the old surveys. I have part of the Virginia mm -hmm. military survey. So where it gets really tricky is where in the Virginia military survey, they would go out and say, okay, we're going so far and we're gonna hit this black oak tree and then we're turning. That black oak tree is mentioned in the deed. It is a survey marker. So again, technically by law, the people to take it out should be surveyor and to replace something yeah. there, that has to be a surveyor. Place the marker. Yeah. So in that, in the deed. Yep. And that kind of gets to that last question, which it looks like almost everybody did very well on that. All those instances are places where if you need to know where a boundary is, you should hire a land surveyor to help. And unfortunately, Mark and I took too long to edit the six videos we've already got, but we have footage with a land surveyor who actually works for ODOT. And we went to the field and talked to him and actually showed him doing some survey work and, and finding boundary markers and stuff. So that's a video that's coming. And we've got a couple other ones planned, especially ones on like uh, hunting implications and, and what you should do as a landowner to think about freshening up those boundaries before the hunting season and, and some of that. And, and then hopefully we'll lean on Peggy sometime to get her out here to the field and do another video on maybe the legal aspects, but that'll probably be down the road. So. And one of our comments earlier in the chat session there or something was uh, asking about uh, the boundary lines are only painted facing one way by their neighbor. Should they, should they paint the same trees? Our, our marking system should take care of that. But again, a good boundary is something that you can see coming and going any direction, not just one way, okay? Yeah, that's why yeah. I liked that purple paint legislation that can't seem to pass the Ohio General Assembly because it did account for that, that you could see it in any direction. And, and that has to do with how it's painted, not necessarily the color. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the way again, they required. And help me out with this, Peggy, uh, back me up here. Currently in Ohio, there is no set boundary collar. There is no set boundary signage. No, nothing. Yep. So nope. again, any paint is better than no paint. Yeah. At this point. And Making it, still, it visible and highlight the evidence. And, and yeah. it, still, it still sets up the big difference in law. I'm not a lawyer, Peggy, but no stretch. So back me up again it still sets the precedence of the intent. If I paint boundaries with white paint, blue paint, purple paint, doesn't matter. But if somebody crosses that boundary to do intent of harm or whatever, right. now we're into trespass without question, okay? And yeah. what's really neat is uh, I think Peggy you received this from us as well. Uh, we just had a nice example of this in Ross County, a court case from last month. Yes. And it has a lot of citation. Uh, I know you guys can't see it all. Uh, here, let me put this thing down first. Uh, I know you can't see it all, but everything that you can see in pink, <laughs> if I hold it, is all reference to the boundary line. And there are, I think, six direct mentions in this uh, right up here of the basically the summary of the case that it specifically talks about the boundary line or property line. And again, it does a nice job of laying out the trespass and so forth. And, and again, if you read the actual findings, it's very obvious that it was a trespass. Mm -hmm. And it started with that boundary line. And because of a pro properly marked boundary line, that adjacent neighbor was com compensated treble damages, which based on their estimate of the value of those trees and some additional um, thing so it, it because that boundary was marked it really worked out in favor uh, of the person who had the trees set that were up. Yep. yep so here's oh. a question that kind of goes along with this um have you ever come across landowners replacing 
or placing a rebar pin where they believe the boundary is? Yes. Um, again, only a licensed surveyor can do that. And this is in one of our videos there. Um, Dave, help me out if I can't, can't remember which video. It's the that corner is. one, I believe. It's. Um, I believe so. You'll yes. see me standing by a big corner post, a big wooden corner post. And that is an example where the landowner took the pin out and put the post in. And again, that is not a deed. That is not a legal way to do this. It was not done by a surveyor. It was the landowner, adjoining landowner, pulled it out and put it in. Again, we have no guarantee that that's in the right spot, but it's also not called for in a deed. So it does not yeah. equate to anything more than what you've seen in the video of the beer can. <laughs> the beer can is not called for in a deed either. So. Yeah. So you can put markers out there, temporary markers, as long as you're not claiming they're the, you know, the official not survey legal. boundary. Yeah. Yeah. They're highlighting where the evidence is, is what, what you want to think about is you're going to paint and you're going to highlight and adding some extra fence posts in a line if the old fence posts are gone or adding little poster markers. And again, the paint is the other way to do it on trees is a way to highlight the evidence that's out there. Yep. And always do it with your neighbors. Don't do it without them. Make sure everybody's in agreement of what's coming and going. That'll save you the biggest headaches. And actually question, the last question in Q&A from Tom Mills is in marking boundaries, how do you maintain the straight line going from pin to pin? It's kind of the, kind of the same deal. Do you uh, want to address the, that, Mark? Yes. Uh, you can see me using the compass in that one video. And again, that compass is going to be used to give you that straight shot all the time. Um, again, you got to have your deed to tell you what straight line you're trying to follow what degree you're going, how far, all that stuff. Um, so basically you're just using that like a gun sight and keeping it a straight line. And when you're painting the boundaries, don't get obsessed with a perfectly straight line because unfortunately the boundary evidence isn't gonna be that way over many years. So again, just communicating it's in that general area with the face markings and so forth. That is better than nothing in a heartbeat. And what Mark's talking about, the videos will make it very clear when you get a chance to watch them all. But normally when you mark the tree, you're going to put the paint, the paint marks in line with the boundary. So where the fence runs through a tree or the boundary runs through a tree, you would have it in line with the boundary. But if you don't have a tree on the boundary, then you put a dot of paint facing that boundary. And you do that on every other side to, to point to the fact that the boundary is to the way the paint's facing. And I like to keep my face marks within about six feet of the boundary line itself of where I believe that straight line is at. Don't get too wide. If you're doing 10 yards on each side, that's really getting pretty vague. Yeah. And so, I just talked to a woodland owner the other day who uses little fiberglass like driveway marker posts for when you have snow. Those aren't going to be official markers, but they could be evidence out there that if you want to fill some gaps with something like that, there's nothing wrong with that. You're not claiming it's a survey pin. You're just highlighting where you think the boundary is. And if you've done that with the neighbor, there's no problem with that. We kind of have two questions that go hand in hand. Um, Susie says, when you all say to record the markers in the deed, how does this work if, it, if you have an old deed? Is there an amendment that needs to be done? And then kind of an added question is, what if there is a tree on the deed that's no longer there? Exactly. That's what, again, a professional land surveyor is going to have to establish where, I guess, a real quick talk on this, which we do this in the videos later with the surveyor as well, that we'll end up doing. A surveyor's job, if you have an old deed like this, is not to create a new line, it's to establish where the line has always been. So their job is going to go to find where that old tree used to be and then set a marker permit today and then write that up. And then it has to be recorded at the courthouse. And again, it would be nice if we had Mr. Donahue on here, the licensed surveyor with us today to answer this. You got to remember to landowners and all that when you have a survey done, it does not mean it's recorded at the courthouse. You got to make sure that last step is done also. It has to be recorded yeah. to be an official record. 
comes by way of the legal description for the property. And many counties have taken to updating the requirements for legal descriptions where we are, we've moved from those old meets and bounds descriptions to the new survey descriptions that are usually are attached as an amendment or an attachment to the deed. So you can update that attachment with that new survey and make it as Mark's saying, you know, a legally official uh, survey. And many require that now, if there's any action at all on that deed, it ha you have to update the survey. And to go along with this again, I've ran into landowners that have their actual survey in their hand and they're telling me my acreage is different. Well, that may be, but if they've never filed that at the courthouse, we cannot use that for anything. It's no different than this piece of paper I have today. If it hasn't been filed at the courthouse, it means nothing. And when it's filed, it, it will be reviewed for meeting the legal requirements to be filed. So there is a little bit of an oversight mechanism there to make sure that that right. property description can be updated with that new survey. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Got a question about what about when a neighbor's tree falls on my property? And we could probably follow up on that. If um, if Jim wants to speak up, we could probably turn your mic on if you're still out there and get you to clarify a little bit. But we'll let Peggy start to answer that. And then I'll see if I can get Jim. No, that's a that's a strange one, um, because, you know, if it started as a neighbor's tree, but ended as yours. Uh, to me, there's two questions. What's the right thing to do as a neighbor? And what does the law say? And I think in this situation, it doesn't necessarily agree. Uh, the two don't agree. Uh, so I'm curious to know what Mark advises people to do when that happens. And then I will tell you uh, if that differs from what the law says. What, what's your common answer, Mark, to, in that situation? Um, first off, was it causing damage or did it add value? <laughs> Jim, uh, yeah, I tried I to turn your mic on, so I think his mic might be on. So let, we'll let him ask that question and clarify it a little bit. Well, in, in my woods, I've had cases where you know storm comes through and blows over big trees from the neighbors. There's just an old fence line there, and they end up on my property. Uh, is it you know their responsibility, or is it can I cut it up for firewood, or do? Or sell it or whatever I want, or do I have to charge them to get it off my property? I look forward to Peggy's um, <laughs> second on this. Um, what I've always seen and what I've always uh, encouraged people is once it's on your property, it's your property uh, up to that boundary line. So again, if it's a tree, it's a big valuable tree, you know, and it's laying on the ground, is it still yours? And in reality, yes. Uh, was it theirs before it fell over? Yes. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good answer, uh, Mark. The law does give rights legally to where that tree falls, um, but it gets a little murky because we could try to argue, um, as you started out with, that that landowner didn't know that was going to happen. Now, if it was diseased and weak and they knew it was going to happen, then that changes the analysis a little bit. But if it was just something completely unexpected, then I think there are cases where the law has said, you should have given them an opportunity to remove and retain their tree if it had value, right? And then the other side of that is, well, what if it didn't have value and it's just created a mess? Should I have to bear the burden of cleaning that up? And that's when we go back to, well, you know, did they or should they have known that this could happen? So it's a really difficult question to answer. And that's why I hate to answer this question because it's <laughs> one of those that has so many, it kind of depends. But if we just look very black and white at the law, it kind of says, well, it's now yours. Um, but that answer doesn't always bode well with, uh, you know, for the relationship between the parties and also just what the value of the tree is and what caused that, that tree to fall. Um, so you could get, you could get into litigation if you don't kind of try to work it out as a neighbor, um, as opposed to just following the black and white letter of the law. Does that make sense? Well, in Jim? my case, it's in the woods and the, uh, the neighbor doesn't live there. They live a few miles away. And, uh, you know, if Hurricane Ike was an example when it came through it, 
I've got a bunch of tangled trees and half of them came from the neighbor's property and some from mine. And it's right now it's still a big pile because it's too big to try cutting up safely. Start out with woods. talking to your neighbor, Jim. Yeah. You gotta communicate with the neighbor. So, um, furthermore, let's talk about that real quick too, since you brought this up, Jim, this is a great segue and, and we'll certainly tap into Peggy again while she's here. I see this a lot also when I'm out and about checking boundaries. A neighbor has a timber sale and they cut down trees and they fell them into your property. That's a no-go. If they don't have your permission to drop them into your property and cause more damage to your property, that should not happen. Yep, completely agree with that. And if there is damage, then it is a trespass basically by the tree. Um, and you could recover damages for that. Okay, we're getting past our time, so I wanna make sure we get the other questions answered. How do land surveyors charge for their services? Based on acreage, question mark? And that's not what I'm comfortable answering. Um, I think you gotta to talk to each surveyor and figure that out, but Mark, you gotta. Yes, I'll give you the factors that go into how they have to function as a surveyor. Uh, depends on the condition of your deed and how readily available it is to start creating a starting point. Uh, again, when I talk about surveyors have to recreate the original lines, keep in mind those original lines might be from the 1800s and they got to go way back. And they also might have to go way far off to get a known starting point to set their degree of declination that was used to create that original boundary line. So it is a matter of how bad the records are and so forth around you and how much effort they got to go through to piece that together. So uh, again, if you can have a neighbor that has good boundaries, that's helpful. It may not be your deed, but it might be the starting point right beside you and it would make your survey quote cheaper. So. Yep. They're all different and mm -hmm. all surveyors charge differently too, so. Yes. What about um, the question on proper placement of no hunting and trespassing signs? Um, we've talked about painting up to date. We actually have a video clip we've gathered with some trespassing signs in various stages of decline, but we haven't included those yet in the videos we've got out there yet, so. Yep, do you want me to start, Peggy, or would you like to? Sure, go ahead. Um, I try to do this with a little bit of sense of humor like I did in the presentation. There's a certain amount of uh, illiteracy or literacy that you gotta think about. Again, signage is great, but if somebody says I can't read, I'm not sure, um, but, Again, by law, we don't have to put up no trespassing signs. Uh, the biggest thing I encourage you to do as a landowner is enforce what you intend. Set an example. The signage isn't such a big deal and the signage can be removed easily. That's why we encourage you to paint boundaries. If you go out someday after you painted your boundaries and your boundary paint's all gone, you're gonna know it in a hurry. Uh, signage is another additional thing. I'm not telling you not to do it, but uh, it's common knowledge too out of the outlaw community that I get to hear and see evidence of that the best hunting's on the back of those signs. <laughs> Say no trespassing, no hunting. <laughs> That's not a good idea. So uh, it kind of opens up a can of worms, but again, right now under current law, Peggy, we don't have to post it, right? No, no. I mean, and having a sign posted uh, can help if you do want to bring criminal trespassing charges because you do have to show that intent to trespass. That is different for civil trespassing. You have to show actual harm from the trespass, but those signs can be, or markers can be really helpful for showing that intent to trespass. But otherwise we don't have any requirements. We're, we're really behind the times in Ohio. Many states do have boundary marker requirements and we just don't, <laughs> unfortunately. We often say uh, around our shops that we're the closest thing to the Wild West in Ohio as far as some of these things go. We're very consistent from the 1800s to today, it's still the same. Yep. And I don't know why that is. You know, that purple paint law that I've mentioned has come up repeatedly in the legislature and it just never goes anywhere. I don't know why they don't want to address this issue, but it's certainly a problem. Sure. Um, for, for me, again, I've had a landowner this summer that painted with purple paint. Uh, 
just out of experience of doing this, I don't know why, but purple paint does not show up well on a sunny day in the summer. When you have mm -hmm. light and dark shade and sun, it is extremely hard to see it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell so you why. So purple may not be the right color for us. Yeah. 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 I know other states have other colors. Yeah. And again, I'm aware that the purple paint law exists in other states around us and all, and that's fine because again, they're just setting that message. And what I like about Ohio's message is it doesn't matter what color paint you use at this point. As long as you've got something up that you establish that they are trespassing, you're doing the best mm -hmm. you can. Yeah. It makes other, it harder for them to argue that they didn't know they were trespassing. Right. Yeah. The other thing Mark mentions frequently in those videos is the color of paint might matter if you're in Southern Ohio, where the state often uses yellow for their boundaries. So if you use yellow and there's state forest land all around with yellow paint, someone could easily confuse your property line with a state forest boundary. So be aware of the colors of paint that people are using around you and try to use something a little different to make sure. Um, mm. But most of the state, the state forest land uses yellow. I know that for a fact. I know the, the old mead paper land typically uses orange and I'm adjacent to a piece of that land. So those are colors you may want to stay away from, especially if you're near some of those properties. Or if you have to use those colors, go to the signage with like Peggy's talking about and add a little signage to it. It's okay. Because yeah. again, any paint's better than no paint. So Danny, I see somebody's hand raised in attendees and I cannot figure out who that is. I would turn them on, but for some reason, it's not allowing me to do that. Can you? If that actually... is Jeremy Scherf, do not do it. <laughs> Can you do that? If if not, whoever's got their hand raised, if you would, um, it's Russell. I set them to allow. So allow they should be able talk. to speak. Okay, Russell, do you have a question? You'll need to yeah. unmute, Russell. What about distinguishing between trailblazes and boundary oh. markers? Anybody want to give that a shot, Mark? Sure. Uh, trail blazes uh, hopefully aren't running a perfectly straight line, Russell. Um, you can also distinguish that by color. Uh, again, the Buckeye Trail is a light baby blue color. Um, so they, again, mean things, but uh, they usually don't blaze their trails. They usually just paint them. If you're talking about truly blazing, like you might have seen in the videos, but it would be a good idea if the Buckeye Trail or another public trail runs nearby you, definitely use a different color. Um, I probably would not use blue if you're near where there's public trails that are painted blue. So keep, you know, be aware what colors are being used around you and try to use something different. And then again, that might be a place where you want to add some no trespassing signs if, if you're getting a lot of traffic and confusion because of that. Well, I did have almost, it? yeah, Russell, did that? Did that... I don't hear Russell anymore, so. I have right 1130. Danny, do you see any more questions or chat that we haven't addressed? Uh, no, I'm just addressing one thing in the chat. Um, I, I guess I can just say it to everybody. I just want to, there's been some discussion about equip funds and just to clarify um, someone mentioned about allowing in the terms and conditions of EQIP, you are allowing inspections and those inspections are so that um, they can see if you're getting your practices completed in order to get you payment. So it's not like they're inspecting to like come do anything with your property. It's so that you can get your payment for that. But All other right. than that, I think. Uh, I'm sorry, I was trying to read other things there and all that. I'm trying to read the post on that same thing. Um, right now, we don't require boundary paint to participate in EQIP. No. Uh, it's not a prerequisite. So no. it, it's nice because, again, everybody knows where they're working then. So we no. won't beg you for it, but you don't have to. No. So. You don't want to pay a contractor to treat your neighbor's trees necessarily. You might, but you want to make sure that's what you're doing if you're paying them. And then you probably ought to get your neighbor's permission to treat their invasives too. So, all right. Well, I really want to thank Mark, especially for all the work uh, putting those videos together. I don't even want to 
try to figure out how many hours we've got in those. And then Peggy for joining us and adding the, the legal side of it. Again, we did link on that web page to some of the resources that Peggy has through Ag Law on fence line law and fences. So be sure to check out that information. Peggy, do you want to mention what else is up there around fence? Balls sure. and regs? Yeah, there's quite a few on the fence law. And we have uh, coming soon a new um, neighbor law <clears throat> handbook that will be coming out. And that will address boundary issues even further. And that hopefully will be out in January-ish. Okay, if I great. can uh, get it formatted. <laughs> That's awesome. Just, just for the good of the group too, Peggy, uh, not to get into it too far, but again, the fence line law, when it's time for judgment, rulings, whatever you want to call it, it goes through the township trustees as the first step. Is that right? Well, under the revisions that passed a number of years ago, you get to choose if you want to go township trustee route or common pleas route. Trustee yeah. would be a much cheaper, uh, quicker route, but you, you now have the right to choose. But typically they go through the trustees. Yes. Awesome. Well, mm -hmm. thanks everyone for joining us. Um, be sure to check out the rest of those videos at your leisure and feel free to reach out to uh, either me or Mark or Peggy if you have legal questions. We'd be glad to do our best to answer your questions. Um, also, when you leave, a survey will pop up. We're just trying to gather a little information on who's participated. We don't have, it's not linked to your personally, but if you're a woodland owner and some basic info, and if you've already logged off, you may have already gotten that. And so I don't know if it, it popped when you logged off temporarily or not, but if it did, I apologize. But with that, it's Friday. And if you get a chance, please be sure to spend at least part of your day out there in the woods before the oh, rain hits. That's a nice thought. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, Peggy, I'm going to go a step farther and say that my dream, well, my goal, let's not do a dream. That sounds too weird. <laughs> Uh, my goal is to invite you down and Dave and yourself and maybe even the surveyor do a little video session or something on a woodland boundary situation so we can heighten this even more. Good. I'm in. Thanks. Everybody have Thank a great day. Take care.